Okay, thank you so much uh, for coming tonight. Um, my name is Philip Duval. Uh, if you haven't seen me before, I campaign on behalf of Equality North West, uh, which is a local group affiliated to the National Equality Trust. Um, we as an organisation are most concerned with the vast inequalities of, of wealth in this country and the corrosive effects that that is having on every aspect of our society. Um, the financial crisis, which is obviously the subject of tonight's talk, um, has only made this problem worse. Um, whilst ordinary workers are losing their jobs or having to take pay cuts or pay freezes, the banks have kept their multi million pound bonuses. That would be bad enough, but the huge sums of uh, taxpayers' money given to the banks to bail them out is now having a profound uh, impact on our public services. From youth services to libraries, from education to health, the losing the services left, right, and centre. Okay? We were told in uh, 2008 that there was no uh, other option than to bail out the banks. David's work, I think, over the last three years shows that there's much that we haven't been told uh, and that the crisis is, is far from over. So I'm very honoured to have David Malone here to speak to us tonight. He's one of the best documentary makers uh, around today and his book, The Debt Generation, um, is a key resource in understanding this crisis uh, and not only what is happening in the UK, but in Europe, in the United States and indeed uh, around the world. So, David Malone. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to talk to you about inequality directly because you know more about it than I will. Um, but I thought I could possibly be of help in giving you a view of the financial crisis which is different from that which is generally the one presented in the main news outlets. Um, by way of preamble, I'd have to say I'm not an expert in this. I've not been formally trained uh, in economics. Uh, the, my journey to come here was that um, 2007 I was reading The Guardian, like many of you, and as I read about the financial crisis, there was something about it, the explanations I was being given which I didn't believe. So I did what I normally do, I, I went off and started doing some research. Uh, what I did, rather than sit down and read economic textbooks, which I'd already looked at and wasn't mightily impressed with, is I went to the bulletin boards where traders people actually in the financial markets talk to each other. There are these places. Most of what they say is, is sh trader shorthand, where they're just swapping tips about you know, a put on July 5th, buy it at 25, don't buy it at 30, put a stop out at 10, and you think, what? In between that, they tell each other what they think is going on in the market. And I quickly realised how important a resource this was, because Whatever I thought of their personal politics, and most of them, and these are American boards, were my country right or wrong, bomb them back to the Stone Age, and uh, ultra-libertarian. So I didn't have much in common with their politics, but what I quickly realised is, when they were saying what they thought was going on in the economy and in the financial crisis at the time, they couldn't afford to have their judgment clouded by political judgment. For the simple reason they were going to take their family's money the next day and bet it on something. So if they were going to follow a fiction, a knowing fiction, based on their political convictions, they would go bankrupt. So there was a kind of a raw, bare-knuckle honesty to what they thought was going on, and the rightness and wrongness of what they thought was proved to them at the end of the week. And the more I read, the more I realised what they were saying was a world away from what we were being told. And as the months went by, they seemed to be continually on the money, if you pardon the expression. And so, I, the more I read, the more I realised we were being sold a fiction, and that just made me intensely angry. So for two years, I was um, outraged from Tunbridge Wells writing on The Guardian. Um, and eventually I was asked to start a blog, and I did, and I've carried on. So that's the background that I come from. So the, um, I have no political axe to grind in this. I, I find the party political bickering that goes on to be a distraction, an intensely annoying one. Um, what I want to talk to you about is an alternative view, which is not just mine, which a great many people in the financial world would agree with. Um, and which, uh, now having written the blog for, for a couple of years, I have quite a number of quite senior bankers who, on the quiet, read what I have to say and send me emails. And if there was something fundamentally wrong with what I was saying, 
they would be quick to tell me because when I get things wrong, they send me a private email saying, look, you said this, that's not quite right. So the fact that people who live up there on the top floors are quite happy with what I'm writing lets me know that even though it's unorthodox and people will say, well, I don't like the way you use that term, you can still take what, I, what I'll tell you as, as a viable view. Okay? You may not agree with it, but it's, it's not crackpot. All right. Um, when, we, when, the, when the crisis broke out, the word that we heard was, that it's a crisis of liquidity. Liquidity was the word that, which they used. Um, um, and that there was no alternative, therefore, to the things that needed to be done to sort out the liquidity problem. Okay, first off, what is a liquidity problem? Right. Um, would you lend us a pound? Okay, he will, that's fine. Um, I've got a pound. Um, I, do, I, I have one, it's just, it's, um, it's kind of stuck in the line, I can't get it out. Right. But you're not good for it. Now, I've got a liquidity problem. I've got the money, I've got the assets, I just, just can't, I can't get my hands on it. Um, and I've got someone I need to pay a pound to, so if you lend me a pound, I'll sort my, my bill out, and I'll give it back to you tomorrow, okay? All right, that's what you've just, that is what's called the overnight interbank lending. That's what they do. Barclays needs to say, pay someone the tenor, they just can't sell the thing that the tenor's tied up in. They say to another bank, would you lend it to me? Right, the liquidity crisis was that, A, the banks couldn't seem to lay their hands on some cash um, because a lot of the loans which they'd made, the income from those loans wasn't coming in. People were, not, were defaulting on their mortgages, so that's why they, didn't, that's why they couldn't find that quid. Um, and then you would have heard about how banks stopped lending to each other. All right? So, <clears throat> if, um, if you were willing to lend me a quid, it's because you think, I'm good for it. Because right? in my pocket somewhere, there's a pound which has got that nice goldy colour and it's worth a pound. Now, if you had reason to believe that the pound in my pocket was actually a little plug of tin, and I painted it with a humbro paint to make it look like a pound, you wouldn't, you wouldn't lend me the pound, would you? Right. Now I've got a liquidity crisis. That's essentially what happened. The banks n suspected, I would say knew, that the assets which other banks said they had, but they just couldn't, they couldn't sell them, just they, they weren't worth what they said they were. It's not that they couldn't find that asset. They knew where it was, but they couldn't find a buyer for it. And so then this thing called the repo market, which is where one bank will lend to another the cash they need for, to settle some debts that night or that week or that, that month, and the, you'll repay it. That's what a repo is. That is the bank, the, what happened. That's a liquidity crisis. Fine. So when you heard it's a liquidity crisis, to, the, to that extent, it's true. But it's the same extent as if you saw someone of dying of bubonic plague and the doctor said to you, he died of a temperature. Now, admittedly, he did have a roaring temperature. And when he had the temperature, he died. But did he die of the temperature or did he die of the bubonic plague? What was the thing that caused the temperature? Right? And that's where the lie comes in. There was a liquidity crisis, but why was there a liquidity crisis? And never a word has been said about it. Right? That was my reason for writing the book and starting the blog, because, and this is an aside, however grave a crisis this is of a financial nature, I believe it's not nearly as serious a crisis as it is of our democracy. The fact that we weren't necessarily told a lie, but we weren't told the truth either. There was no public discussion about what is the real nature of what's going on. And if we're going to have a discussion about that, maybe we should have a discussion about what would actually be a good solution. We were told it was a liquidity crisis, and therefore we must give money to the banks. And there is no alternative, as you said. And there wasn't for us, because we weren't given any means of discussing it, whereas where I went to talk to right-wing traders, there was a roaring discussion and very clear alternatives. Why weren't we told? Do we live in a democracy or do we not? And it bothers me that the press, who are either stupid or complicit, went along. Something is very, very wrong. Right? Whether you believe me and my version or not is it, irrelevant. That problem still remains. All right, so that's a liquidity crisis. But if I um, don't, if you don't believe that that's 
that asset is what I, worth, what I say it's worth. And that's a solvency problem. Because I don't have a pound. I am insolvent. I'm trying to borrow money from you when I don't have any money myself. Right? That was the nature and is the nature of the banking crisis. And we, we know that because the banks keep writing down what their assets are actually worth. Which means they weren't worth what they said. And therefore the other banks were quite right to not lend them 10 billion because the assets which the bank was putting up weren't worth 10 billion. Now that is a solvency crisis. All right, well, I've made my analogy. The question is, what was that fake plug of tin, the, 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 uh, the analog to my pound in my pocket? To understand that, you have to take a slight, you have to understand, and this is the nub of the matter, sometime in the 80s and 90s, and you, you can argue about what year it was, it doesn't matter, there was a fundamental change in the nature of banking, debt, and money. And part of our problem talking about and arguing about the crisis is that we're using terms which don't accord with the way things are. We're still using the terminology as if it was the way it was when my parents went to get a mortgage. Okay? When my parents went to get a mortgage, they went into the Midland Bank, and it was very frightening because they met a bank manager, and the bank manager asked lots and lots of questions, very specific to them, and the bank manager said yes or no. He had the power of driving death over them. That was the old-fashioned way of banking. Banking used to be very dark. What you did is you went to ask the bank for money. The bank had money because it had taken in deposits. The bank quizzed you very closely about what you were going to spend it on, what your outlays were, because the nature of banking was that that bank lent you the money, made a contract with you, they gave you a chunk of money, and then they had to wait 30 years while that money came back in. Now, over the 30 years, the bank is going to go make money because you're going to pay them quite a lot more than they gave you. But nevertheless, they had a big chunk of money that they could have gone out and bought a truckload of Smarties with or gone to the Bahamas with or done anything with. Once they've given it to you, they don't have it anymore and they're going to have to wait for 30 years to get it slowly back, which is why banking was dull and didn't grow. Do you remember, in, well, those of you who are old enough, in the 60s or 70s, did banks grow to enormous size suddenly? It was physically utterly impossible. Think of RBS. In 10 years, it went from being a small, parochial, careful um, Scottish bank to being a world strider. That was not possible given the old kind of banking. Right? And here we come to the number. They invented in America something called securitization. Right. Think of the old method of banking. I give, the bank gives you money, and all they get back in return is a contract saying you're going to pay the money. They can't do anything with that. That money they gave you is now dead as a financial instrument. They can't do anything with this agreement. Securitization does away with that. What securitization does, it's not complicated. They dress this up with lots of terminology. It's really quite simple. The bank used to have a big drawer full of agreements with different people. Each one was different. This is my agreement with you, this is my agreement with you, this is my agreement with you. You, you all borrow different amounts, you all have different jobs, you all have, you've got a gambling problem, you're an upstanding citizen, you're all not sure about. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you can't use this for anything. Someone had the brilliant idea. They said, I tell you what, why don't we make standardized buckets of debt? Okay, what I mean is this. When you give out mortgages to people or loans, even if I decided that a hundred of you were quite similar, there is a statistical probability, just like there is that the statistical probability of the age at which people will die, there's a statistical probability that one or two or three of those mortgages will default. All right? So if I was to try and spend, to try and parlay these bits of paper, all right? Let's say three out of a hundred statistically are going to go because someone gets run over by a bus, someone has a nervous breakdown. It's going to be very difficult for me to sell these bits of paper to someone because three of them are utterly worthless, aren't they? So if you're going to buy them from me, accept them as collateral, three of you are going to get completely ruined. Securitization does away with that. It says we won't sell these intact. What we'll do is we'll chop them into pieces and put a hundredth of the income from each of the mortgages into a hundred different parts. All right, so now, if one of them goes under, no one of you, one of my investors, gets killed. 
each of the securities which contains a small slice of the income from this will suffer a small loss. Brilliant. It's the equivalent of if everyone in this room had been abroad and you all had bits of currency from different countries, it'd be very difficult for us to exchange them. You've got a zloty, you've got a won, you've got a dollar. What securitization does is melt them down into the base metal and recast them in a standard ingot. That's what securitization is. It's very clever. Right? And, it, and it was invented for many good reasons. But it did something which they hadn't figured on. Think of the old banking method. You, as the bank manager, you lend me a big chunk of money. Right? And your income depends on me paying it back. So you need to be very careful, classically bankerly conservative and nitpicking about lending to me. Because your income for the next 30 years depends on it. If what you're doing is the new kind of banking, where you lend me money, but then you don't keep this agreement and hope that I don't default on it because that's your income, you sell this to somebody else whose job it is to buy 100 others, 99 others, chop them up, put them into pots, and then sell those securities, each, each pot which contains a slice of all the mortgages, you sell it to someone as an investment. Because they're in that pot it entitles them to a little bit of the income from a hundred different mortgages. What's your interest now in whether I default or not? You haven't got money. Because you don't own the mortgage anymore. Well, now you think, hang on. I earn 20 grand a year by making out a hundred mortgages. If I make out 200 mortgages, I'm going to make 40 grand a year. So what are you going to do? That's the side effect of securitization. Okay? Banking just changed, didn't it? Completely and utterly. You no longer are a kind of boring man who wears socks and sandals and drives on Austin Maxi and is very, very conservative and sits in Barclays Bank going, oh, I don't think so, sir. And now you're the kind of bloke who goes, come on in, yeah, I'm sure we can help you. And that's what happened. All right, but they very quickly ran out of upstanding systems like this gentleman here to give mortgages to. So someone said, well, there are a lot more scruffy looking Herberts and dodgy looking characters around than upstanding gentlemen. If we could only give mortgages to them, we could write, you could get rich. You'd be writing out mortgages to your hand hurt. And securitization hides, as we just said, some of the defaults in the pots, but it doesn't hide all of it. So then they came up with something else. They came up with insurance. They thought, bingo. We'll insure the securities. Right? Let, me, let me tell you what I mean. I made up my security from 100 little different bits, and I say to the person who's going to buy it, the income from this, there's, there's 100 different 100,000 pound mortgages in this, you're going to get a slice of it. This piece of paper, therefore, has an income that's worth, let's say, a million pounds. Right? That's the income that you're going to get if 97 of these mortgages stay good and the three little bits don't go right? So that's what it's worth. This is the second huge change that's happened. I've just created a new kind of money. I, don't know. I used to have a completely unique debt of debt agreement between us, which I couldn't do anything with. Once I've got securities, it's a kind of money. I can say, it's worth a million quid. So if I want to borrow, borrow a million quid from you, so here you go, it's an asset, it's worth a million. And you know it is. The banks have found a way of printing their own money, their own international, interbank kind of money. Because if you think about a five pound note, it, on, somewhere on it, it says, I promise to pay the bearer. And if you look at the bottom, of a mortgage, it says, I promise to pay. They're both debt agreements. The difference is, five pound note, the promise is backed up by the Bank of England and behind that, the Treasury. Whereas the mortgage, you'll find that the person guaranteeing it is Billy Bob from Barstow, which is where the problem came in. It's not such a good promise. All right. So two things have changed, the nature of banking and the nature of money, a new kind of money which is not controlled by governments and banks can print as much of it as they want just depends on how much debt they can get, they can sell and turn into securities. That's a whole new world. Nations are now printing a fraction of the money that's actually in circulation. Their ability to control the amount of money, the amount of credit, goes to zero, which it did. 
That's why you notice through the Thatcher era, less and less was said about M2 and M3, all those measures of money. They kind of got quiet about that. For the simple reason that they had no control of it. And the amount of pounds which the Treasury was printing up was as nothing compared to the billions which the banks were printing up. Okay.